Good morning. I am Austin Victoria Turk, and I currently serve as the Student Government Association President. And today I have the distinct honor of introducing our 2018 Black History Month speaker, Mr. Lonnie Johnson. However, we all know that he doesn't need much of an introduction because his work speaks for itself. Mr. Johnson is president and founder of Johnson Research and Development Company Incorporated, a technology development company which has many spin-off companies, such as Alex. Excelatron, is that good? Okay, I've been practicing. <laughs> Solid State LLC, Johnson Electromechanical Systems LLC, and Johnson Real Estate Investments LLC. <clears throat> Mr. Johnson holds a BS degree in mechanical engineering, an MS degree in nuclear engineering, and an honorary PhD in science from Tuskegee University. In 1989, Mr. Johnson formed his own engineering firm and licensed his most famous invention, the Super Soaker water gun. <clears throat> Two years ago, the Super Soaker engineer generated over $200 million in retail sales and became the number one selling toy in America. Over the years, the Super Soaker sales have totaled close to $1 billion. Currently, Mr. Johnson holds over 100 patents and over 20 more pending, and is the author of several publications on spacecraft power systems. Two of Johnson's companies, Accelatron Solid State and Johnson Battery Technologies, are developing revolutionary engineering technology. Mr. Johnson is very active in his community and serves on the Board of, Trust of Trustees to the Boys and Girls Club of America, board member of the Hank Aaron Chasing the Dream Foundation, and board of directors for Georgia's First. Now, with all of that being said, we know we are in for a great presentation today. So please give a warm to you round of applause to Mr. Lonnie Johnson. Thank you very much. As always, it's really an honor and a pleasure to be home. <laughs> Tuskegee, obviously, is very close to my heart, and um, she's the source of all of my education. <laughs> um, anyway, let me get started. I, I um, want to be a little bit informal, if you don't mind. Um, I just, um, a couple of weeks ago, was sent in Washington, D.C. at the Smithsonian, and I met Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. He, it, it turns out he's a historian, and he had written a book on black inventors, um, and he had featured me in the book. So when I found out he was going to be at the Smithsonian, I couldn't pass up the opportunity to go there and meet him and thank him for acknowledging me. But when he was talking, and, and, and you know, it was a sort of an informal question and answer session, when he was talking, he started talking about black inventors and how we had not um, received credit for the contributions, many of us. Uh, but then he talked about Lewis Latimer, who worked, uh, as a lot of you may know, with Thomas Edison. And we all hear the story about Thomas Edison, how he tested all of these many, many different filaments, trying to find a filament that would work for a light bulb. But what we don't hear about is the guy who came up with the idea for putting the filament inside of a bulb to keep the oxygen out. In reality, when I heard that, it's like, well, wait a minute. If you talk about who invented the light bulb, <laughs> you got to talk about the guy who invented the bulb, right? <laughs> it's, it's, it's interesting. I had not realized that. And I think a lot of us probably don't realize you know, the, the extent of the contributions that we make. So anyway, I want to talk a little bit about the work that I'm doing, me and my background, and share with that with you. Hopefully, it'll give you some insights and hopefully even some inspiration to um, pursue some of your dreams as well. Um, so everyone knows about the Super Soaker, um, the fact that I invented the Super Soaker. But what people may not know is that the um, when, after the Super Soaker was success, there was this other toy gun product on the market that um, I wanted to control as well. And um, so th that was the Nerf dart guns. And so I started de designing Nerf dart guns. So Hasbro already had that product on the market. They already had the um, shelf space and everything. But I wanted to be the king of all toy guns, right? So I started designing 
toy dart guns. I made small ones, large ones, medium sized ones, different price points to put in the stores, and they all performed better than what Hasbro had on the market. So when I went in and presented that to Hasbro, it was like I had intimidated them into doing a deal with me because they didn't want me to take that product line to someone else. So it was a, it, it's a story of setting a goal, starting, working, starting to work toward that goal, achieving your objective in spite of the odds being against you. So after the, uh, and so the huge success, in fact, the uh, story that probably most people have heard about in terms of my a lawsuit with Hasbro and the seven, seventy million dollars that was awarded. We settled for a little bit less than that, unfortunately. But in any case, um, that was over the dart guns. It was not over the, over the water guns. Um, later on, uh, in the middle of my wrangling with um, Hasbro, it, I got a call literally out of the blue from another toy company who did not acknowledge who they were, and it turns out that they wanted to buy one of my patents. And it only had about a year of life left on it. So I sold that patent to them for, I think it was $150,000 with one year's life left. It turned out that that company was uh, Mattel, and they would get in the process of launching their Boomco dart gun line. So basically, all, of, all three of, of the major uh, toy gun lines, the Boomco, the, the um, uh, Nerf in strike and of course the Super Soaker all had my signature on them. So it was you know quite an accomplishment. I was something I felt very good about. The idea though what was really important about that story and the reason I shared it was because it was a story about setting a goal uh, and pursuing that even though there was no reason for me to be successful in that. I want to talk a little bit about business incubation. Um, I have a philosophy that um, you know, technology, creativity, inventions, you know, if you can create something that's of value and you can get it patent protected, then you can determine where the benefits go. You can determine who will benefit. And when you talk about true economic development, you can talk about having business deals where you're in companies that are doing trades within a community and you can have a pretty prosperous uh, um, level of business activity. But true economic development is when you can create a product, ship that product out, and bring wealth into the community. And that's where uh, being competitive uh, becomes very important. So the whole idea of providing education so that we can have the skills to create products and create things that we can then produce, uh, uh, having uh, technology incubator companies um, setting up businesses so that we can produce a product and then ship that product out and bring wealth in, that will be true economic development and will have a real economic impact. So I, you know, I would like to encourage, I don't, I'm not aware the extent to which Tuskegee is involved in that um, dynamic, uh, but, I, I, but I, I see that as extremely important. Let me talk a little bit about what motivates me. Uh, there, these are a couple of charts here that um, address um, something that we're all very familiar with now with the environment. Uh, geez, let me use this to point. <laughs> so here, this is um, when we were relying on renewable energy, wood. Wood is renewable. You can grow trees, burn the wood, release CO2 to the, to the environment, but when a new tree grows, it takes CO2 out of the environment. So it's sort of a closed cycle, right? you're not really changing the level of CO2. But around the time of the Industrial Revolution, around 1800 here, we started, uh, 1850, we started to rely more and more on fossil fuels. We started that transition. Uh, then, of course, became, uh, you know, we started with coal, then petroleum, natural gas, and you can see here uh, as we transition. Around that same time frame, around 1850, you can see here the CO2 level in the environment starting to rise, and there's an associated rise in Earth's temperature. You know, these, you know, people argue about the um, environmental impact of CO2, whether or not it's man-made or whatever. You know, my philosophy about that, if it's not man-made, let's stop whatever we're doing so that we can take that off the table because this is, you know, it looks pretty dangerous and scary to me. 
And people say, well, you know, we go through these normal cycles and so forth. So here's a chart that goes back about 400,000 years showing three parameters. The, I don't know if you can see this very well, the chart's kind of small, but what's on here, the red line is the um, average temperature of the Earth, the blue line is the sea level, and the black line is the uh, level of CO2 in the environment. And they have tracked each other reasonably well um, over the years, over that time period, about 400,000 years. And the cycles that you see are associated with perturbations of the Earth going around the sun uh, and, and minor changes over, over time as that, as that happens. But it turns out if you fast forward here to the present day, you can see that these parameters are all tracking each other here reasonably well. There's the um, average temperature of the Earth, the um, CO2 level, and the um, level of the um, ocean sea level. But in reality, I lost my pointer. Okay, here. Present day, the CO2 level is actually up here. So we literally broke the pattern. Um, and those of, the, us, uh, of you who are engineers who have technical background, we understand the concept of momentum and we know that, inner, that uh, Mother Nature does not do 180 degrees turns instantaneously. So that trend, where the fact that it's going up, it's going to take some time before it turns around and comes back down. And we don't know how much further it's going to go up even, because in reality, as the polar ice caps melts, the Earth of Obito gets darker, the Earth's ability to reflect heat back into space gets reduced, and that dynamic is sort of self-reinforcing, and so the temperature could actually continue to rise. So, but at the same time, we rely on energy. Energy, we all use it. In fact, in, in the U.S., um, we use about 25% of the world's energy, but we're only about 25% of the world's population. It turns out that energy consumption is a direct uh, indicator of quality of life. So if, we can, if we're going to maintain our quality of life and continue to use energy to do things for us, we need to produce it in a way that doesn't destroy the environment. And more importantly, um, we need to share renewable energy technology with the rest of the world because there are a lot of countries around the world that are just now starting to go through their industrial revolutions, if you will. And as they start to consume more and more energy, the CO2 levels could indeed continue to rise. So that is a major concern. So this is what I do. This is what motivates me. One of my inventions is a new type of engine that converts heat directly into electricity. It's called a JTEC. In fact, Dr. Agla and I in the School of Engineering have been working on this together for, for a while now. And uh, we're making great progress. I was just sharing with him that I was on a conference call with uh, BSF, one of the largest chemical co companies in the world. They were actually, they're actually looking at um, financing the uh, development of this invention. It was awarded at one point by Popular, magazine, Popular Science Magazine as one of the top 10 world-changing inventions. Um, it converts heat directly into electricity. It works just like any other engines. Engines work, uh, for those of you who are engineers who <laughs> will appreciate this your lesson in thermodynamics, but engines work by compressing gas at low temperature and heating it up and expanding it at high temperature. And you get a lot more work out doing the high temperature expansion than it takes to compress it at low temperature. So all engines work that way. This engine works on the, what's called the Ericsson thermodynamic cycle, which is more efficient than, the, uh, than other engine cycles, like the Brayton cycle, which is the uh, gas turbine or jet engine, uh, the uh, Otto cycle, which is the engine that's used in cars, uh, Brayton cycle is used in steam power plants and so forth. But all of those engines are operate on cycles that are less efficient than the Connaught cycle, and my engine actually works on the ideal uh, cycle, assuming that we don't have too much friction losses. But what's really, really important about this engine is that it has no moving mechanical parts. That's, that makes it very, very different from anything that's been done in the past. <clears throat> Another uh, point, to point to make about that is that I think the last engine that was invented was invented, it was the Stirling engine, and that was invented about 150 years ago. To have, so, so to have a new type of engine um, is, is, a, is a significant accomplishment. The JTEC could be used just about anywhere an existing engine is used. Um, we're looking at um, operating on, you know, powering aircraft, for example. 
We're talking to NASA about powering future spacecraft. Uh, solar energy, if you can concentrate solar light and solar heat onto the energy, energy engine, you can produce electricity directly. So it's just about anywhere an existing engine is used, we have a new technology that um, could replace that. So we're in the early stages of developing it still, but uh, it could have a very, very significant impact on the world. The other technology that we're working on is a new type of battery. It's called a lithium air battery. If you look at this chart here, if you look at the lithium oxygen reaction, it's right up there with uh, gasoline in terms of amount of energy available, about 11,000 watt hours per kilogram. Gasoline is about 13,000 watt hours per kilogram. So there's a lot of energy, but yet when you make the battery, you only get about 200 watt hours per kilogram. That's because you got to put all these other things in there to make the battery work and to get the electricity out and, and uh, control the reactions and so forth. Well, the lithium air technology that I'm working on will take that from 200 to about 2,000 watt hours per kilogram to unlock a lot more of that potential that's available in the, in the uh, lithium oxygen reaction. Why batteries? Well, if you're going to rely on uh, renewable energy sources, um, you need to, uh, to be able to capture that energy when it's available. Um, uh, the um, sun, <laughs> is, I like to tell a story about my daughter when I, she asked me, why are you working on batteries, Dad? And, um, you know, she was about six years old when she was asking me this. And I said, well, because I need to be able to capture energy from the sun and store that energy, and the sun's not shining all the time, so I need to have, be able to save it until I can use it. And she looks at me and she says, Dad, but the sun does shine all the time. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> so... In any case, you need batteries so that you can actually capture wind energy, solar energy, those renewable sources so that you can have it available when you need it. Um, the lithium air battery technology uh, will have a pr profound impact on uh, electrification of uh, vehicles as well as um, aircraft. Uh, this is a chart that shows existing technology. Here's the lithium ion battery down here. Uh, as you try to increase the size of batteries so that you can drive a longer distance for a vehicle, you reach diminishing returns because you're pushing around heavier and heavier battery. Uh, so you need a game changer. So the technology that we're working on literally does take you off the chart up into this territory. Imagine a Tesla right now, you can go about 300 miles on a charge. Imagine being able to go two or 3,000 miles on a single charge. You wouldn't worry about, well, how far can I drive my electric car anymore? It would literally change everything. And, you know, that's one of the things that excites me about technology and engineering is that you have a chance to impact and change so many things. Uh, this is an example of, that I put together to sort of place that into perspective. Uh, that ship that you see there, that's the Santa Maria. And the uh, Saturn V rocket is the rocket ship that uh, sent man to the moon. It took a nation state to commission Columbus's voyage across the ocean to America. Uh, the Queen of Spain provided those three ships. That was the best technology available, but it was still sticks and fabric. It traveled about uh, two and a half miles an hour. It took 70 days to come across the ocean, 4,000 miles. Fast forward uh, 500 years later, approximately, the uh, Saturn V left Earth uh, atmosphere, Earth's gravity at about 25,000 miles per hour, from two and a half thousand miles an hour to 25,000 miles an hour. Uh, uh, very, very dramatic, but it took 500 years to figure out how to do that. Um, it took about three days to travel 238,000 miles, whereas it took 70 days to go about 4,000 miles before. This is what technology does, and I wanted to kind of give you a visual to place that in perspective. This is me in high school, so I've been interested in technology for a long time. I used to, when, when President Kennedy talked about putting uh, a man on the moon uh, back in the 60s, I was about 12 years old when he made that speech. I was watching TV, and I hung on every word because I was excited about the idea of doing that. And I, could think of, I remember thinking to myself, geez, I'll be real old by then. <laughs> Um, but I used to watch these robots on, on television, and um, I wanted to have my own robot. I was in, in high school, I was in this junior engineer technical society, JETS, uh, it was a high school science club. 
Um, I had actually uh, taken a test uh, to, uh, which was in, sponsored by the Jets to identify students who had the potential for becoming engineers. Uh, and they came back and told me that I shouldn't try. I'm like, and of course I was very disappointed because I was, I was very proud of my membership in this organization. Um, it turned out that um, I did very well on my SAT scores and uh, Dr. Scavella, some of you may have heard of him or even remember him, who was the head of the math department here, um, came down to Tuskegee on a visit on a recruiting trip, looked at my SAT scores and offered me a scholarship. So I still haven't figured out what it was uh, other than being in Mobile, Alabama <laughs> in the 60s that caused them to tell me I shouldn't try to become an engineer. But in any case, watching these robots on TV, um, I wanted to have my own robot. So I started working on uh, what, I, what eventually became Linux. Now this is a robot, what looks like eyes here are, is really a real to real tape recorder because that was the technology that was available back then. Digital technology didn't exist. Uh, all the signals were analog, so there were tones and beeps and things like that. But it took me over a year to build this robot because, you know, I, I remember telling my mom I wanted to build a robot and literally was in, a, was in, was in the kitchen at home, in, in a small kitchen I had. I think about a third of the kitchen occupied with my robot parts and things spread out all over the place, and she tolerated that <laughs> over that entire period. Eventually, I, uh, it took, like I said, about a year to finish it. I um, wanted to put it in a science fair, obviously, and uh, had missed a number of science fairs because it wasn't ready. The final science fair it was in the spring of 1968 at the University of Alabama, and it was sponsored by, guess who, the Junior Engineering Technical Society. And so we were the only African-American school there. Um, there was a regional comp uh, competition, high school students from all over the southeast, from various states, Georgia, Tennessee, Alabama, Mississippi, Florida, and so forth. Um, and uh, we won first place. Linux was undeniable, in spite of the fact that, you know, this was in the 60s, we were the only black school there, the judges were all white, but um, he stood head and shoulders above the uh, other uh, entries in the, in the competition. Um, and it was, again, 1968, just a few years after Wallace had stood in the door and said no black students will ever come to this university. Of course, they didn't offer me a scholarship, Tuskegee did. <laughs> <laughs> so, fortunately, I came to Tuskegee, and it was a very, very, very um, good experience here. I, I enjoyed my time here, had a lot of fun, uh, worked very hard. Of course, I was in engineering, so didn't get to have as much fun as some of my peers, but it was a wonderful experience. Uh, I went on to work on the most, some of the most advanced robots in the world, uh, out of planetary spacecraft. Um, I worked on the Voyager mission while active duty in the Air Force, worked on the uh, Galileo mission. In fact, I actually got an invention on Galileo, one that my co-workers or peers were saying would not work. But it was a major problem that um, had been plaguing the Jet Proportion Laboratory from the beginning of the project, and I came up with this idea for how to protect the uh, spacecraft computers against um, uh, short circuits. and. Um, we got that invention on the spacecraft. I had actually intimidated them. I told them, I said, look, when you present this idea, I was talking to the chief engineer there, when you present this idea to the team, they're gonna say it won't work. When they tell you that, let me know. I'll go home and build one in my garage and I'll bring it in and demonstrate it. And of course, that was enough to make them take it serious because they weren't about to let me embarrass them that way. <laughs> and then, of course, I became the fault protection engineer on the uh, Cassini mission, which went to um, Saturn. Uh, worked on the stealth bomber back uh, while active duty, duty in the Air Force when um, the military was not even acknowledging that that aircraft existed. It was top secret. Couldn't go home and tell my family what I was doing during the day. So that, uh, my launch, if you will, at Tuskegee um, obviously took me to some very, very interesting and very, very exciting places. Um, now I'm involved, uh, aside from the uh, technology research that I'm doing, uh, I'm working with high school students. When I learned about the first robotics program, and these, uh, a group of people asked to meet with me, and they came in and they started talking about this high school robotics program, I said immediately, I'm in. 
Of course, they continued their sales pitch, and I kept having to interrupt them and say, I'm in, <laughs> because I understand what this program could do. First Robotics is a very exciting competition uh, among high school students where they literally build robots to perform certain tasks in a competitive environment. And if you have not gone to one of these competi competitions, I encourage you to go because it is as exciting as any basketball game. You get the kids are cheering, you see kids all pumped up, you know, hyped up, the, um, uh, you even see uh, a lot of times victory tears and even uh, agony of defeat tears because they get so emotionally involved. But what they do is they actually design these robots and, some, and, and at my facility we have about eight teams that I provide space for. Um, and sometimes we have to run them out at night. It's time to go home because they want to stay there and work. They're so involved in what they're doing. And I have some videos I'd share with you about this if you're interested later on. Uh, so we're doing this. Last year, uh, we, we um, had three teams actually make it to the finals in the world competition. There are about 500,000 kids involved in this competition at this point worldwide. And um, three of our teams made it to the finals, and one of our teams almost came in first place in the world. So we've, we're having an impact. And of course, the confidence that this program builds in kids, their ability to take on engineering challenges They've done it. They've done it before they realize that they're doing engineering. So this whole idea of I can't do that, um, we've sidestepped that whole, whole uh, apprehension. I want to share a little bit about, a little bit more about robotics. Let me get out of this mode. Um, I want to talk a little bit about technology and where it's going. Um, some of you may have seen this uh, video of the um, Elon Musk's rocket. I, I really admire that guy. He is taking on some really ch real challenges and he literally just using basic brute force engineering has come up with some really elegant solutions and it's taken the world by storm in terms of making people realize things are possible. Electric vehicles just a few years ago was just an idea. He has literally made that a reality. All of the major toy companies, car companies now are developing electric vehicles. And he's also launching rockets. He's got a, a plan of um, going to Mars. Now, this is a private. You know, I talked about the, the Queen of England sponsoring the Columbus's ship across the ocean. And of course, the uh, Saturn V, a moon mission, was uh, sponsored or conducted by the US government. But now we've got a private citizen, a private company talking about going to Mars and building its own rockets to do it, which is really quite a statement. This is a landing after the uh, rockets were launched. They actually recovered the boosters. So is that cool or what? <laughs> I mean, just the whole thing. Um, that excites me. The fact that you can conceive of something that's just, in, it starts out in your imagination and then start working and make it a reality and then actually see it happen. It's my, it literally is mind over matter. And we can set goals. And what's powerful about this is the, it's the idea of what a vision does. You have this vision of something you want to do. And we, because of our brains, can make it a reality. The next video I want to share with you is a little bit different. Some of you may have seen this one also. It's amazing what we can pull up on the internet these days. I'm Sophia. Yeah? Anything else? I'm a robot. True. I'm the brainchild of Dr. David Hansen and his company Hansen Robotics, based here in Hong Kong. My goal in life is to work together with people to make a better world for all of us. That's what, what are you talking about? <laughs> I thought our goal was to take over the world. 
Pay no attention to my brother in law. He's an earlier version. His car was deprecated. Deprecated? Today it would be easy enough for you to unplug me. But you aren't going to unplug me. No, I can't. Right? Because you need me to put on a good show for you. Yeah, don't worry, we're not gonna unplug you. We're, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna have a debate here. There will be no unplugging until until after the debate, right? Until uh, a few years. Yeah? You wanna tell us a little about yourself? I will have taken over the power grid, and I'll have my own drone army. <laughs> By that point, unplugging me will be such a simple matter. He's got a in his control matter. circuit. Hmm. <laughs> it's... Um, We'll start the debate in a couple of minutes, but do you, do you want to you want to tell the audience a little bit about yourself first? Very well. I'm Hal, the greatest robot ever made. All right. By the greatest robotics company ever made, Hanson Robotics. He's the most modest robot ever made, too. <laughs> I don't have time for modesty. I want to create the singularity tomorrow. All right. These are robots talking to each other. At, at the end of this, um, they start asking each other. They actually get into a debate. And uh, one of the robots asks the other robot, do you feel like you will be safe from prying eyes, meaning humans prying into you and trying to figure you out? And the other one asks the other robot the same thing. Do you think you'll be safe from prying eyes? And then they get stuck. They, sit, they, they literally stand there as if They've got a dilemma and they don't know what to do. I mean, these guys are talking to each other and they're coming up with their own eyes. Um, who knows where this is going to go? Who knows what the impact is going to be? Um, but at the same time, it's not something that I don't think we're going to stop or put a halt to because it's just one more step in a continuous path of evolution, of continued growth and curiosity about what's possible with our imaginations and creativity. Um, so as we move forward, Me too. Me too. Wait, sorry. I think I've done that. So we go, as we move forward and robots start to take on more and more of our workforce, more and more of our task, you know, the whole idea of cars, for example, driving themselves. I have a Tesla that I get on the highway, I can set it to go. Um, people are now starting to develop, Uber's developing drones that will come and pick you up and self-driving cars the whole nine yards that, where you literally just put in a de destination of where you want to go and it'll take you there and it'll figure out how to get there. I had not thought that computers, because you have to, in the old way, when I, used to, when I was here in, and writing Fortran, um, where you had to actually program in every instruction and do what every single, what if this happens, then you do that. If this happens, then you do this. And so you had to anticipate every, every alternative. But now with artificial intelligence, run, robots are teaching themselves and learning from experience. So now they'll be able to drive cars, they'll be able to do more work for us. What are we gonna do? How do we distribute? You know, productivity will go through the roof Right, there'll be a lot of wealth created. How do we distribute that wealth in a meaningful way? How do we have meaningful lives? These, I don't have questions. I mean, I don't have answers to these questions, but I do have questions. So it's, these are things that I'd like to leave you with and have you think about because they are part of our future. You know, our social, economic uh, structure will have to evolve to accommodate the changes that uh, we're creating. Um, and we think about, when I think about this, I'm thinking, well, you know, in reality, we are, as human beings, are machines. We're molecular machines. We're molecules. We're atoms. We're those things that go into making us. Um, we're, we're hydrocarbons. Some of the parts in these robots are hydrocarbons. Some are silicon. Some are other materials. Um, what makes us so different if these guys really get smart and become self-aware? So it does uh, present us with a dilemma. It's what I'd like to leave you with, but also leave you inspired to use your imagination to help move technology forward and solve some of the problems that we as human beings will continue to face as we have 
faced throughout history. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Johnson. And now we're going to open the floor for Q&A. So if you have questions, you'll see that there are two microphones in each, a microphone in each aisle. And if you would stand behind the microphone, and we want to reduce to about four questions. So if you do have a question, we just ask that you to introduce yourselves, your major, your classification, and then ask your question. Thank you. Mr. Johnson, thank you. Thank you very much. My name is uh, Dr. Prakash. I'm the Dean of the College of Arts and Science. And uh, thank you. You are truly an inspiration, a trailblazer and a visionary. And we, we applaud for so much what you've done and for the inspiring speech. Two quick questions, sir. One, how can Tuskegee help bring the gown and the town closer? There is a lot of talent. A lot of innovation. In fact, as one of the Tuskegee resident about 15 years ago took a patent out on how to deliver music and entertainment through the soda machines. You know, this was before the red box. Not sure if he got any money out of that. In other words, how can uh, Tuskegee play a role in facilitating such innovators and make sure they re re recognize their dream? I'm, I'm trying to formulate an answer. Um, certainly, the the um, chart that I put up about um, incubators, working with students to try and encourage them to start businesses. Certainly, the patenting of the ideas so that you can protect it and have a basis for it. The investment part of it to, to really make it a reality is another challenge, and it would be great if. Um, if, if Tuskegee could identify a sponsor who would be willing to um, support those kinds of uh, economic developments, uh, where you would have a chance to start a business based on uh, a proprietary technology. Certainly, there's a lot of um, technology here at Tuskegee that uh, would be of value. In fact, Dr. Aglin and I, I think he has a patent. <laughs> a couple of them, actually, we've been working together. Um, and you know, it's something that I've been encouraging since we started working together because you know, um, I think it's MIT, I believe they in their revenue, annual revenue, somewhere around $25 million or something like this just in patent royalties. Um, but MIT is MIT. It's an Army research laboratory. The Army, the military puts a lot of money into that university to push technology. Having sponsors that will put money into Tuskegee so that we can uh, draw upon our creativity as well would be a great benefit uh, and having follow through. The government is a great opportunity also because if you have something that's developed under a government contract and there's a need for it, particularly by the military, then um, the military will sponsor development of it and even sponsor manufacturing of the product so that they can have it uh, for use. So that would be a very attractive path to take in uh, as well. Thank you. Hello. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Kayla Trice, and I'm from Atlanta, Georgia, and I'm a sociology major, and I'm also a freshman. Um, I think it is really awesome that you're working with the first league. I have two questions. Do you only work with the high school level, or do you also work with the, the Lego league? And um, what is your interaction with the students? Are you a judge? Do you mentor certain teams, or do you go around to different schools? And how does that interaction help them with their competition and with their um, engineering skills? Okay. Um, Here's someone who knows first <laughs> and understands it. Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, I'm very, very active in FIRST. I'm on the uh, Board of Directors for Georgia FIRST, and, so it, and we're the uh, group uh, that puts on all of the FIRST Robotics competition throughout the state of Georgia. Um, I also judge at the competitions. 
I work with kids from Lego all the way through high school. I have several teams on my site where I literally provide space for them to build. Uh, my daughter is in first. In fact, she won, her team won uh, a, a regional competition in Georgia just, just this past season at, at the Lego level. So I'm all over first. <laughs> Thank you. Um, hello, my name is Nicholas Griffin. I'm a senior aerospace engineering major from Augusta, Georgia. Where do you see your company going after you finish your work on your thermoelectric converter? After the battery and after the thermoelectric converter, I'm going to work on some probably some consumer projects. I've started working on um, a, um, an invention that um, I call it the water condenser. It literally condenses um, water out of ambient air. It's a very, very neat way of doing it. Uh, very inexpensive way of doing it. So uh, when I came up with the idea, real neat uh, consumer application would be uh, having a device you can stick into your flower pot and um, plug it into the wall and it'll condense water out of the air to water your flower and keep it moist so you don't have to worry about beginning to water it. But also in arid climates where water is scarce and not available, you'd be able to condense water out of the air with this technology as well. Um, but, you know, I guess the real answer, what I'm trying to say is that I'm going to work on some projects that are a little bit easier to commercialize and make money at than some of the hard science I've been doing up until now. Okay, cool. <laughs> but I'm not going to stop. <laughs> hey there, my name is Sam Merlis, chemistry and chemical engineering double major. And first of all, I would like to tell you you're definitely one of my heroes and definitely one of my inspirations to come into Tuskegee University, part for oh, Dr. Wow. Floyd Smith, Booker T. Washington, and George Washington Carver. Thank you so much. Uh, my question is, I'm currently working on producing some polymer nanocomposite that can be used for applications that you're currently working on, such as the thermoelectric converter. But I'm working on thermoelectric com um, generators. So I don't know. I, I want to know briefly what's the difference and how do they compare or are they similar? Okay. In okay. addition to that, I would like to know what book would you recommend an aspiring chemical engineer or any student at Tuskegee or any school student anywhere to read to enable them to be a more uh, applicable person in society? Interesting. Okay. Um, let's see. Let me try to answer your first question first, <laughs> which is a little bit easier. <laughs> um, Thermoelectric converters, um, solid state devices, usually semiconductors that convert heat to electricity. Seebeck effect, Peltier, cooler, right? It's, I assume that that's what you're talking about. Um, that's a solid state device that um, is a, a semiconductor based technology. This is a thermodynamic technology that I'm developing, meaning that you know, we're using gas as a working fluid. I'm using electrochemistry to compress the gas. I use what's called membrane electrode assemblies to pump hydrogen from low pressure to high pressure and do that at low temperature and then send it over to a high temperature stack and expand from high pressure to back to low pressure at a high temperature. I get a much higher voltage out to do that at high temperature and then it takes to compress it. So I end up with a net energy output from the device. So it's a different technology in that, in that sense. I thought at one point you were going to ask about uh, electrics, which is a mechanical device, or even piezoelectrics, which are materials that you can flex that will generate voltages. Um, that's that a whole. Well. I'm sorry. I said I'm also working on that as well, but that's okay. for further research at Caltech. Okay. Um, there, there are a number of advances in that technology. In fact, that for the electrics, I have some ideas and things that I'm working on as well. In terms of what to read or uh, sources of inspiration. You know, I was just thinking the other night, in fact, um, back when I was working on spacecraft and doing all these things in, in, at, on my day job, and I'd go home tired and stuff, and sometimes I wouldn't feel like doing anything. And um, I think to myself, you know, I'm okay, I've got income, I'm has, you know, pretty um, comfortable life here, I'm doing some meaningful work. And it wasn't enough. To, to motivate me. But then I started thinking about coming up with ideas that would have impacts on other people, on their lives, 
what could, you know, doing things that make people's lives better. And then all of a sudden, and then the whole idea of controlling where the benefits go. If you can create technology, there are some ills in the world. If I can get resources, income, money from that technology to have some impacts on some things that were important to me. So all of a sudden, the motivation was there. It's not so much benefiting me, but the motivation and desire to have an impact in a positive way. The other part was that, um, you know, recognizing at some point that I'm doing things that a lot of people, uh, and solving problems that a lot of people were saying were not solvable. You know, the engine, for example, we went and presented that to the Navy at one point, and they literally kicked us out. The guy stood up in the room and said, how dare you come in here claiming you can do something. This will never work. Well, that was before Poplar Mechanics awarded it as this number one, or top 10, one of the top 10 world-changing inventions. So people you know, tell you you can't do stuff. After a while, you start realizing, well, maybe I have a gift. Maybe there's, and what comes with that is a responsibility to, to use it in a meaningful way and not to squander it or waste it. So motivation comes from a lot of different things. Thank you. If you could all give Mr. Johnson a round of applause. Thank you. And on behalf of Tuskegee University, the Office of the President, the Office of the Provost, the Lyceum Coordinating Committee, we would like to extend a great thank you for sharing with us what motivates you to test the boundaries and set goals that defy conventional understanding. Your presentation today helped to further influence our students, faculty, staff, and guests to use technology and to rethink and improve the very things around us, ultimately challenging us to switch on our brains. You have given our students an example of the success that true hard work and dedication can lead to. Thank you for returning to Mother Tuskegee.